with all the big calls on all the big races. Welcome back. It's time for another What A Shout film somewhere in the capital. Friday morning, myself, Dave Orton, with our sponsors, Bet365. Welcome along to the party. It just keeps going, doesn't it? We creep closer to these spring festivals. What a time we had at Dublin last weekend. What a time we had at Sandown. I am thrilled to be joined by you this morning and a great panel. I've got to say that if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. Those subscribers are going through the roof. Anything on Facebook, you can get involved. And of course, Twitter, hashtag what a shout. So, okay, let's go down the line. And it's a full set in the studio this morning. I'm delighted to say Pat Cooney comes and joins us from Stoke, fresh from Musselburgh. Fresh from Musselburgh, yes. And it was fresh up there as well, by the way. It's uh, right by the seaside, but uh, tremendous two days worth of racing there. And I'd say to anyone, just go up there. There's uh, plenty of racing up in the, in the summer as well. Well worth a visit. Real friendly track. Yeah, we're going to have a chat about that a little bit later on. The front runner himself joins us back, Chris Cook. Hey, Dave. Good to see you again, Chris. Great to be here. Have we recovered from storm control in the Skybet chase at Doncaster? No. Oh. A couple of weeks ago. <laughs> For anyone that didn't watch Chris's return to the show on oh. um, Doncaster weekend, of course, trials weekend, storm control when he was 16 to 1, before all the big judges got on him. Yes. We got the value, didn't we? We got the value. <laughs> I, it didn't seem to get paid in the end, but no. I mean, come on, man. That was a that was a galling one, wasn't he? He went off a right price as well, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've never seen a a long distance handicap chase that was so obviously over and then turned out not to be over. I mean, it was worse than Crisp and Red Rum. Um, <laughs> I, I totally get why young and experienced jockey, and I guess you know, with the full benefit of hindsight, he's made a mistake, hasn't he? Pressing on when he did, but I can totally get why he did it. You know, he thinks the horse that's in front of him is beat. He's worried about the ones that are coming from behind. He thinks, if I shilly-shally around here, I'm going to look stupid after it. So he kicks on, and then the horse takes the mickey a He bit. got away with it in Newbury, of course. <coughs> probably thought, I'm in control here, but this is storm control we're talking about. These things happen. But Chris's radar is hot. Not quite as sizzling as our guest this week, however. Is there a current jockey riding at the moment enjoying better success? I doubt it than Charlie Deutsch. And he joins us for this morning's show. Charlie, great to have you making your debut on What A Shout. No, thank you for having me and uh, great to be on it. Great stuff. You can see that Charlie's been riding out this morning at Venetia's, his bosses, of course, and uh, your Friday morning. He's just about to go to Banger for a couple of rides. It's fair to say, Charlie, things have been going rather well for you. You've had 216 career winners, we counted, 158 of them for Venetia. And uh, you've kept your head down, of course, and things have gone well. Congratulations for finally making it over the line in a grade one. I say finally because you've knocked on the door a few times. Yeah, no, it was a great feeling. And, uh, yeah, we, we made sure we won it anyway. We were miles clear and... Um, no, I've been second in a grade one before, uh, a couple of grade ones, but um, uh, yeah, no, it's just great, and um, the horses are running really well, and yeah, all thanks to the news, really. Um, I'm in, I'm in the right yard at the moment, anyway. Well, uh, quite, absolutely, but it's fair to say you're a popular guy in the weighing room, Charlie, and I don't know if you heard, guys, when when Charlie won on non press, of course, in the Silly Isles. Uh, thank goodness he won for the British Novice Division. We'll get into that with Charlie in a second. Uh, but when he came out, Pat, there was like a guard of honour for him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you I ever had one of those? Uh, not, not, <laughs> not yet. I, 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 I live, in, I live in hope. I think the last time I remember seeing it was Jamie Moore when Sir de Grugy won at the festival. And Charlie, when he won at Sandown, I thought, what, what a marvellous touch from uh, his, his uh, fellow uh, weighing room colleagues. So... Uh, Clearly a very popular guy and a very talented guy. So I'm glad uh, the ball is rolling his way. And didn't we need a star novice in that intermediate division? Uh, I guess we did. What we really need is, um, you know, a serious British trained horse going to the Cheltenham Festival. And, and you know, he's definitely that, isn't he? He's going to go there um, unexposed, really. Um, you've got to be taken seriously. One around the course. Uh, lots of ticks, aren't there? Shall we go and find out then just how good he is? Now, Charlie, I spoke to you in the week. It's been a pleasure setting this interview up with you this week. It's fair to say this is the best horse you have sat on, right? Um, yeah, I'd say he's, um, he's the best. Yeah, he's the best I've sat on, I'd say. And um, it's all very exciting, especially when they're progressing. And uh, yeah, we've just got to find out. I suppose Kelton would be the first time we find out you know, how good he is, really. And uh, Obviously, it's been very smooth and easy so far, and he's got everything. He's got, he's got, you know, he jumps well, he's relaxed, and um, he does everything right. So very exciting. 
Did you get off long press then last Saturday, Charlie, and think straight away, OK, Cheltenham, here we come. I mean, obviously, this is the Turners, of course, is where he's going to turn up all being well, the two-mile four race, known as formerly as the Marsh and the Jail Team, whatever and else, the Golden Miller to any of us old boys in here. But um, did you get off him, Charlie, and think, you know, I've really got a shout. I mean, coming to two out, is this a horse that can put it up to the Irish? Um, I hope so. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, those grade ones, you don't really know because of the, it's, it's, it's just gauging how good these horses are. Because, you know, in handicaps, you can gauge horses a bit easier. But um, in the grade ones, it, all it takes is a freak, like, you know, out of your 50, and you don't know which one is the next, you know, champion that can reign over the, uh, the next season or two. Um so, yeah, I know, all I know is he's very good and um, he's classy and um, he take a very, very good horse to beat him. Um, so, yeah, I'd be looking forward to it. And um, it, it's just great to get the grade one first of all. And then, um, yeah, looking forward to Cheltenham and hopefully all go smoothly on the way there. Yeah, a lot of people will be expecting that to be nearly your first Cheltenham Festival winner, I think, Charlie. Uh, OK, let's, let's let's stick on this vibe. Um, we mentioned Storm Control, didn't we? Uh, we've been talking, haven't we, um, off air before we came on. How many of these handicap chases in England and Scotland in particular? I don't know why not. It, it's not the case in Ireland so much. But why are they, all these r- races now? There is a, an alarming trend of front runners, isn't there? Yeah, it, it does seem to become the fashion. And I was going to ask Charlie about that. But given that Phoenicia's horses jump so well and they're hard fit, is there no better place to be than in the front? What is it, Charlie? Why the, Why are these big handicap chases? We saw in, in the sky, I bet, the aforementioned. But it does seem to be, of course, when you won the Labrooks Trophy. Cloudy Glenn was up there as well. Um, yeah, I think um, I think it's important to get a good start in those races. So you're always pushing forward at the start um, and then you can hold a good position um, and and then obviously if you're in front it's just straight forward you, you can kind of travel at the pace to suit your horse um, you've got plenty of light to see the fences you can concentrate in, on jumping and it you can also get a very good rhythm um, you know it, it yeah it does seem to be the case that um, a lot of front runners seem to win these big handicaps and uh yeah, I suppose it depends on obviously pace and um, things like that. But um, I think it's hard to pass for in a good rhythm and jumping very well. And um, when you're in front, you can get a breather. You can dictate the race sometimes and get a breather where you want to, really. Um, that's kind of my experience. As we all know, being taken out of your comfort zone is not something to enjoy. Uh, so, Charlie, a star in the ascendancy, young man absolutely going right at the top of his game at the moment. Let's have a look at then. We've got a nice graphic coming up for our viewers out there of the biggest race wins you've had so far. And, uh, of course, you can see their long press at the top. We've got Royal Pagai, runs this weekend. We've got Fernando Civola, runs this weekend as well. However, Pat... This is not perhaps the reason why Charlie is the most notorious at the moment. No, I remember if I could ask Charlie if he could go back to April 2020 and his ride on ASO in the virtual Grand National, who was five lengths clear when he fell at the second last. And I was going to ask Charlie in hindsight, what were you doing riding a doubtful stayer so positively? And do you think you still would have won? Well, uh, yeah, I, I was on a certain and um I don't know what sort of stride I was looking for. And I don't know what I was doing kicking on that early. I was saying, I was <laughs> all the way. Um, what is he, what are you doing? Just take a pull, man. <laughs> oh, God. And, uh, and then, uh, and then when he, um, yeah, uh, you know, before two out, when I kicked on again, I was surprised he had the, the extra boot. I thought he'd be getting tired by then, but uh, I had it in the bag and I started to get excited and um, it was all over and it was, Dramatic and emotional. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's have a little reminder of exactly. It was Ed Bailey, wasn't it? Your housemate who put this up this tweet. Let's, yeah. have, a, let's have a quick reminder. The race at your mercy. Oh, how do you feel? Oh, just disgrace, isn't it? Heartbreak. <laughs> Absolute heartbreak. 
So look, that's up to 114,000 views already. That was one of the most popular races ITV have ever shown, Chris, wasn't it? I mean, we weren't really <laughs> doing anything else at the time, were we? And it was pretty gripping stuff. And you don't often see the double face plant from both horse and jockey <laughs> straight into the turf. No, whoever did the algorithm didn't work out that he probably wasn't an actual stayer. And also, come on, be a bit kinder to the fallers out there. It was a brutal one, wasn't it? Yeah. Of course, you have fallen at beaches before on Old Udbonza's oboe. Of course, typical with this weekend as well. You'll be looking for a strong national rider, I'm Imagine now, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm sure we'll have a few entered, and yeah, I'm not sure what, what I'll be riding, but um, yeah, hopefully, I have something. All right, okay, great stuff. Let's see exactly what we've got coming up on the show while we've got Charlie Deutsch. Let's press on with the action then. There's your big race previews. It's Betfair Hurdle the weekend, but there is a sterling cast as well. Great racing at Warwick as well to get our teeth stuck into Cheltenham contenders everywhere you look. We'll be doing some talking points for you as well. And of course, those all important weekend winners. Shall we go into the big race previews out there for you? One fifteen, then. My Lord, this is a way to open the card. We were teased, gentlemen, last weekend that Nichols was thinking about getting Brave Man's game out. He runs in the novice handicap, 2 mile seven one last year by Enrillo. Of course, that chap went on to run in your big race, the name dramatic mm -hmm. scenes. Mm -hmm. But here we have a horse that's being compared as the next Denman by the champion trainer, Chris. A lo lot of people expect him to maybe win at Cheltenham. Uh, definitely next, key, next year's King George winner, they're calling him. This is probably the stable star at the moment. After drawing stumps this week to find out what's wrong with the horses, because they've been running a lot like drains, haven't they? Of course he had a winner last Saturday at Sando, Dolos. Um, you would think that a nice little novice hurdle might be the way to go. <laughs> but here we are, the first race on Saturday, and with your big hope. This is a very well-named horse all of a sudden, isn't it? Yeah, maybe that suggests some kind of confidence in the horse, but uh, I mean, Paul, I guess his, his nerves are going to be, you know, in shreds when this race ticks around. Because the point that he made when we spoke at Wincanton was, you know, these horses all look well. You can't see that there's anything wrong with them. Um, and then when some, some of them run, it's not all of them by any means, but some midway down the back stretch, they just, you know, the lights go out. Um, and he obviously doesn't want that to happen with such a high profile horse, you know, one of his big Cheltenham Festival hopes. Um, but th this is this is a real potential trap here. I mean, there's there's danger because this is Brave Man's game's first time in a handicap. Um, he's done that thing where you know he's in small field conditions races um, and he's worked his way to a high rating. He's very talented. Obviously, he deserves a high rating. But but in those races, you can so often look a bit better than you are, and then you turn up in a handicap and you've really got to prove it. And he's giving more than a stone away to everything, including a couple of you know quite interesting young improvers natural born chasers who are essentially still competing off their hurdles ratings, or at least a rating that derives initially from their, their hurdles campaigns. Um, they've got a lot of juice left in their ratings. Um, and does he have any in his? Um, it's, it, this would be a serious test for him if the yard was flying along at its usual 23%. Mm. But in a situation where, in fact, the strike rate is 3% recently, um, it, it's a major worry. And I, honestly, I think anyone who's taking 11 to 8 on about Brave Man's game needs their head felt. You know, it needs somebody feeling their head to find where the bump is because it's a, it seems a rash decision to me. Well, this is traditionally a strong weekend for Team Ditchy, isn't it? And you sense that there will be a treble out there on Saturday of Brave Man's game 115, Clanders over, of course, spinning to win the Denman again, and Hitman in the game spirit. A pivotal treble, Pat Cooney. Now, let me come to you. Now, when your traders were looking at this race, when the, after the decks had come out on Thursday, I mean, I was on the phone to my producer, Kieran Thurwell, and we, we, he said it's... 15 to 8 with one firm. And I said, 15 to 8 on. He said, no, 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 15 to 8 against. We quickly put down the phone. And we, <laughs> and we sussed out. But that might be considered an old school Rick because half an hour, 45 minutes later, and a lot of social media activity went up about that 15 to 8 as well, let me tell you, against. He was quickly into 11 to 8 on, as Chris said, 4 to 6 on. What have we seen since? Well, he's, it's a light betting race because it just has to be really, doesn't it? I mean, we weren't 15 to 8, that's for sure. I, I see wisdom in wanting to oppose him because, as Chris has alluded to, it, he's going to have to be pretty talented to win a handicap anyway. He's, he's given an awful lot of weight away to some very uh, smart horses. Um, but I, I just keep thinking, this, you know, this is Paul Nichols. He, you, know, he, you know, they have the little dip in January year on year on year, and every year he ends up champion trainer or just about champion trainer. I, I think you have to be in Paul's camp here and say, look, he wouldn't be running this horse unless he was absolutely bang on 100% with him. 
That said, looking at it as a punter, asking me to back him at odds on, I would say, look, there's probably 200 races over the weekend. I can find you an odds on favourite with better claims than him. I hope he wins. I think uh, we need him to win to bolster up the, uh, the UK Irish rivalry at the festival. But you can let him go on back, that's for sure. Yeah, but I suppose Pat's fancy, Chris, might be the one who's obviously got some decent yeah. entries, isn't he? Well, there's two, I mean, and that's the difficulty for me. The main question for me in this race as a punter is, uh, is it Grumpy Charlie or Pat's fancy that you're taking on the fav with? And I was thinking you might even have a look at maybe doing a reverse exact or a reverse forecast for those two horses. Um, slightly risky with novices because all it takes is one of them to belt a fence and then you're knackered, aren't you? But um, Pat's fancy looks the one. I mean, he was so impressive at Chepster that day and he's beaten a horse that then went to Cheltenham in a handicap and won easily. Mm. Um, and he's gone up like eight pounds, I think, Pat's fancy for Chepster, hasn't he? He was going to run at Exeter, wasn't he? They pulled him against mm. Dusart the other day. Is um, that right? Oh. So he's come looking at this. And listen, fair play to the other trainers. It'd be fascinating, wouldn't it, when you read me Members Club, what our roving reporters will get quotes of the other trains Of all the races on Saturday, dare I say this is the most interesting. Yeah, and as you touched on that, one fifteen. You don't see a horse like Brave Man's game running. It's a great for party. ITV, isn't it? It's great yeah. for it's great for the media. You know, yeah. this is what we want. And it'll set the tone, won't it? Because you know, whatever happens to Brave Man's game, that's what people are going to expect from the rest of the. What did you make of a Hoy Senor? Well, let's keep on this for a little bit. What did you make of a Hoy Senor? I mean, he's Frank the form no end, isn't he? Uh, yeah, and well, it's, it's it's obviously going to be strong form. Uh, the the Weatherby race with a horse in your that it did lack a bit of depth. I mean, I quite fancied St. Pally in that race, and then he's walked into the first two fences in the home straight, hasn't he? Yeah, but no, I've got, but see, I've taken a different view on that. Did I mention Noble Yates to you when we chatted yesterday? Yeah. Didn't I? This is the Emmett Mullins Paul Bernholz. Watch it back. I mean, if that doesn't be, if that's not fancy for a big festival in the spring, I'll be very surprised. So I don't know, but my point being that a horse in your won, as we hoped he would, mm. they're now talking about doing the Coney Gree. And going to a gold cup. Should, I don't know. I think Brave Man's game, well, I'm with you. You can't back him at 8 to 11 on. And it'd it be one for the multiples, I think. Yeah. Who's going to be brave enough after? If Nichols had had a runner in an opener <laughs> and it had run well, the price might crash. Absolutely. But unlike Dolos last week, a couple of the others, you know, the two horses, unfortunately, he took to Dublin Racing Festival, and poor Frodo and Grenzine, both well beaten, weren't they? Brave as it was for the industry that Paul was attacking like that with his campaigning, I don't know. This has got me going, this. What are you going to do? Are you going to be like the front runner and press the lay button? Let's pop to Warwick, shall we, for the brilliantly named Kingmaker Novice Chase. I don't know about you guys. Lots of people talk about Sandown being the, you know, crest of jumping tests. But Warwick, Chris, for me, it's a right sight, isn't it? Five yeah. fences come up very quickly. And I always think if you can get through that as a novice, you're going to go very close in an arc. You know, Cheltenham should be fine. However, this race does have a bit of a worrying record when it comes to arc of winners. Yeah, I mean, to reach back quite a way into the, the distant past to find one that went on to Cheltenham and, and to glory. But, um, and I, I think as well, it, it can set up quite nicely for front runners, can't it, Warwick? You know, there's something about, if you can just you get in front, You've not gone too hard and meet those fences just right and swing around that bottom bend. All mankind, and everyone else is not, in yeah. trouble. You yeah. know? Um, so it, it turns out in this Kingmaker, we've got four runners and three of them are quite comfortable going forward. So it, maybe it's going to be a pace burn up. I sort of hope that really because the, the one definite hold up type, Edward Stone, is the one that I fancy. I mean, he's, he's going to be a short price. Everyone likes him. Um, but I think his credentials are strong. And, and being somebody who's quite into trainer form as well. That's just coming good because Alan King was having a bit of a dry spell in January. I think he, I've got my stats here. He was one from 41 in January. So far, four from 19 in February. So it's, it's all coming good. King, he was loving that everyone was talking about Nichols doing it then. Yeah, <laughs> right. OK, yes, you're right. I've noticed that this week as well. He, I think he had a massive price winner at Doncaster. A track we always associate King with winners, didn't he? And right. It, so absolutely, Chris, not something there. Let's come to you then, Pat. Right, we've got two proper Arkle candidates here. And before we talk about what the Dublin Racing Festival might have hinted towards the Arkle itself, Edward Stone, the most popular? Absolutely. And as, as Chris has just touched on it, you can see the race setting up very well for him. I, I normally, when it comes to Warwick Novice Chasers, I tend to like the free-growing front runner that might get an uncontested lead. I don't see that being the case with Third Time Lucky, Brave Siasco, Four Pleasure. They all like to go forward. You look at Edward Stone, with Tom Cannon, he, he looks like he's got the more straightforward task, just sitting mm. behind and... Pick your punches, really. The race sets up well for Edward Stone. Mm. I thought when he won last time out, I thought, oh, OK, finally, there's a, there's an English horse that might be one, one to put on your shortlist for Cheltenham. And that's still the case. Um, and if he comes through this, it will be a, a good test for him because he'll have probably gone quicker than he's ever gone before. I know that people are saying he's an eight-year-old. He's had a lot of racing. 
can he really keep on improving? But in a novice chase form, he, he is improving with each run. Mm. But this is his hardest task so far. So uh, I wish him well, but uh, he's going to have to earn the victory the way the race is going to be run. Wanting to duck a few tomatoes from the viewers at the moment and people saying it's not all about Cheltenham. Before we talk about the Arkle, uh, uh, are we expecting Eberstone to come through this on top of his old rival third time lucky with the ground potentially in Dan Skelton's favour this time? Yeah, I suppose so. It's going to be tricky for third time lucky, isn't it? Because he's a, such a free going sort. But I mean, he's not going to get the lead, is he? Because for pleasure, it's just that kind of kamikaze mm. whoosh. Um, and so it'll be a case of trying to settle him in behind. Only two weeks since he last ran. Yeah. Um, you know, how easy is that going to be? Uh, I'd, he, I'd be worried. His Cheltenham form is a little bit misleading on the eye because they didn't want to lead. And we, we you know, know people that are close to the connections and they, they are desperate to see him in a big field. Aye. with a proper pace, because he's a swinger, isn't he? Uh, and he bounces off the ground. Of course, Edward Stone thrashed him when they met at Sandown, but Edward Stone... Edward Stone himself is a bit of a freak, isn't he? Can I call him that? If you like. Looked like he... Um, you're not your typical sort of arc horse. A, he's eight. Eight-year-olds yeah. traditionally struggle, sizing you're at the last to do it. I spoke to you about this off-air, didn't I? You were like, is that a problem? And I said, well, when I was a young analyst, it used to be the thing in the arc. Mm. Uh, and he has been beaten in great wood hurdles and things like that, you know. And right. um, so well, people, he's, he's he, run very well in those races. Of course he yeah. has, but the best hurdlers usually win the Arkles, don't they? Yeah. Your Shishkins, your Simon Ziggs, your Sprinter Sacras. Or maybe he wasn't actually quite the best hurdler. But the cream usually rises. This is a year now we're looking for... Say Edward Stone comes through this on top. Is he going to start favourite in the arc, or should people be fingers on the buzzers because of what we saw at the Dublin Racing Festival last week when Blue Lord scraped home over Riviera mm. de Tell, albeit giving quite a bit of weight in a strongly run race? What do we make of that, guys? Well, I'd sooner have Riviera de Tell if those two meet again. Um, you know, I thought she just had to sort of jumped the last in a conventional manner, and she was going to win. But unfortunately, she she made a right horlicks over it for some reason known only to her. Um, yeah, I don't think we have that. Now that we don't have the Fernie Hollow, uh, we just don't have the standout talent going into this arc, do we? Mm. Um, That's but, why I like Edward Stone. For he's, he's, he's very, he seems very solid, very reliable, still got a bit more to offer. He's so blossomed over fences. Yeah, um, You could tell that they expected a lot over hurdles and he wasn't quite showing it, and now he is. Um, I'm prepared to accept that he's a special talent. It'd be great to see Kingy win an arc again, wouldn't it? That sort of race, you know, it'd be fantastic. You know, you, you think back to some of his greats. A nod to Tom Segal as well, of course, who put this up before he won at Sandown, of course, saying this is the, you know, this is the arc one. So if third time Lucky or Edward Stone win this, will we be seeing an arc favourite? I guess is the long-winded question. Uh, I'm not so sure if third time Lucky wins it because he might be ground dependent, and if we get a rainy Cheltenham, mm. we'd be against him. Will he turn up? Yeah. Yeah. That being said, I, I did look at the uh, Blue Lord Riviera de Tell, and I just thought, well, that that was inconclusive I'm with Chris I'd rather go with the mayor to reverse the form but both of them had a real hard race I think if Edward Stone wins this tidily I could see him being favourite and who would have thought that an English horse being favourite for the Arkle Is there any danger of third time lucky t turning up in the Grand Annual if they need a horse who swings along behind a strong pace I mean, well, Should we mention Brave Siaska who, who lots yeah. of people do fancy yeah. for him uh, again we expect he's got a bit to find at the weights doesn't he of course with the front two but for pleasure in there as well are they going to spoil it? Ah <sighs> He's got one way of running for pleasure, of course. He has been yeah. third time lucky. Yes. Brave Siaska is interesting. More to offer, you think. Um, I, I don't think he would have to lead either. So um, I, I'm just not so completely convinced by him. But this is his chance if he's going to be, you know, yeah. serious top class contender. Mm, 205 then. Do not miss it. It's the kingmaker. Let's go to Newbury then again for the 225. And it is the Denman chase. Uh, great memories, of course. And a sterling cast once again assembled. Just a five runners, Pat Cooney. Uh, what price can does Obo as he bids for another win in the race? Well, he's round about even money as we speak at the moment. And of course, on official ratings, he's six pound and beyond in hand over the rest of his rivals. So in theory, the race stacks up very well for him. Of course, the common denominator we have with the, the weekend's cards is the Paul Nichols stable. But... You know, they have the flu jabs every January. It's worked pretty well for him over the years, hasn't it? He's, uh, it, ha it hasn't been a barrier to his success. So at some point, they'll start flying again, and it may well be this weekend. But uh, that's not been the case in recent days. So from the bookmaking side of the fence, you, you don't need too many excuses to take on a short price favourite. And that, that's one of the reasons why I think the market might go against him. Um, second in is Royal Pagale at 9-4. to four. That's only £6 wrong. And then the likes of Imperial Aura, etc., who have got £13 and upwards to find, but they could find it if the favourite runs below par. But I was going to ask Charlie, in, in these small fields, 
What about the pace angle of the race? Because Royal Pagale has the one who ran the most recently, and I presume that's the more fitter, but would he be more inclined to let Imperial Aura bowl along in front? Let's go straight to Charlie Deutsch then. All right, race tactics. Have you thought about it much, Charlie, without giving too much away? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've thought about it briefly. Um, obviously, uh, yeah, Imperial Aura I would have thought would go forward, but um, no, my, my lad's quite straightforward right from behind or in front or, you know, halfway. So um, it just depends on the pace, really, and, and how we're travelling at the time. Um, so, yeah, no, just try and get him jumping, keep it straight forward, and yeah, there's not too many runners. So we, we want to make sure it's a true gallop and um, that'd be about it, really. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the pace angle is, is going to be open to you if you do want to go forward, um, Charlie. And he, he went forward in the Betfair chase, didn't he? He's obviously comfortable on the front end. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Um, when he's in behind, he can drop the bridle a little bit and separate, which is quite nice because you save a bit to the end. But if, if, if they aren't going quick enough, then um, he happily can stride on um, and he doesn't uh, dilly-dally or wander. So, um yeah, we just have to see how it pans out really, and, uh, and 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 see how he takes it. Really. Uh, Charlie, sorry, 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 Charlie. One question with Royal Pagale: Is he soft ground dependent to be at his very best? Um, he 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 surprised me in the bet fair how well he ran it. He, um, he he didn't feel that slow that day, and he kept you know he kept on, and the blue card came past me quite easily. Um, but I don't know. I think a bit of soft ground would help. Mm, I think you're going to struggle for that, Charlie, at the weekend. But I, I looked into the yeah. breeding of him. I, I, and Paul Keeley, who often sits in this panel, as you well know, viewers out there, he very famously, I mean, he's quite close to the Richie camp, isn't he? He said that the breeder told them that this family breeds tractors. So, you know, plough and all that sort of <laughs> stuff. That was a line that we kept punting out last year. But he's blue Brazil, isn't he? And the sire has got a very good record on good to firm, actually. Now, it doesn't always work quite like that, but... I don't know, a reproduction of the Haydock form? I mean, there's, there's a few things to worry about with Royal Pagai and, and the Peter Marshes only three weeks ago. It was a really big effort. And, you know, I dare say he's showing all the right signs at home. But, you know, it's from a punter's perspective. Um, I'd be worried about whether that might have taken something out, out of him. And, and then he's not getting his ideal ground again mm. this weekend, you know. Yeah, OK, Charlie. So I can, I can think what the viewers are trying to probably shout in at the screen now. So, A, what sort of race did he have? Obviously, you went from the Peter Marsh last year straight to Cheltenham. Is it an idea to keep him cherry ripe? Is he that sort of horse, is he? That, that maybe you learnt last year does want some more racing? Um, yeah, well, I think he's quite, he's quite straightforward, really, at home, I think. Um, obviously, Venetia um, knows him very well and... Um, I think it's hard to find the right races for him really, um, when they get to that level. So um, that's probably why I didn't run much last year. But I, I wouldn't be too worried about the quick turnaround. He, really. um, he, he seems in good form at home. And uh, he, um, yeah, he, he, he did have a tough race, but it hasn't affected him. And he's, he's, he's the sort of horse that's quite tough. So um, I, I wouldn't be too worried about that at all, really. He definitely showed that side to his game, didn't he? He looked he looked in more trouble than when he won the race last year. I think much stronger in Neil, Chris, wasn't it? But if you remember, Remastered had a go at him. Uh, Sam Brown, wasn't it, had a go at him as yeah, well. Yeah. Kept ding-donging. Uh, and the fact that Charlie's confident. I, I can see him taking this out. I, I think I probably, of the two uh, biggies at the top of the market, he would be, for me, Clanders Obo. I cannot forgive him for being beaten in this by a secret investor. <laughs> but, but it's that sort of race, and that? You get a small field, you know, a muddling pace. Um, and, you know, secret investor is that kind of horse. He, he, he was sometimes disappointing and frustrating himself, but he had it in him to run a big race. Yes. And uh, this was the race last year that I think convinced them that Clan needed cheap pieces, wasn't it? He has a tr yes, a secret investor had a trick shot, didn't he? I agree with that, yeah. 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 Uh, you like one of this, though, Mr. Cook? Yeah, I mean, it's nearly by a process of elimination. I've um, settled on Eldorado <laughs> Allen. Um, you know, Clan obviously worry about the stable form. Royal Pagai, of the fancied horses, he'd, he'd have the best chance, I think. Um, Eldorado Allen's stepping up in trip and just sort of looking at his most recent races, he's, all he's been doing is sort of staying on, staying on, finishing really strongly. First try at three miles, and it's not going to be a strongly run three miles, I don't think. Um, uh, you know, a dry ground, this could easily fall his way. That he, You know, just when it comes to the business end, 
he's going to have a bit too much kick for these horses that have been running at three miles all their days. Yes. Yeah, so um, I think so eight, nine, ten to one, you know, that's a bit of value right there because well, there's doubts about all the others. I'm sensing a storm control from Chris. <laughs> uh, fast horses against stayers. Where did you look, Mr Cooney? Uh, I'd probably just go up to the grandstand and watch the race, really. I don't see it as a betting opportunity, really. The clan is Obu. The, the, there's good and there's indifferent performances from them, isn't there? And even the money, I'd rather not pay that to find out. So I'd, I'd be a no bet, I think. All right, we've heard from Charlie, we've heard from the panel. This will be the middle of a very important treble, I sense, if you're a Paul Nichols fan. Shall we break it up with some talking points? It would be remiss of us not to, of course, for the Senior Reporter of the Year. Sitting in the studio with us. Uh, so, front runner, take it away. Uh, quite a few big talking points. Uh, the Freddie Talicki uh, trial came up again this week because the BHA have reacted to their findings. Yeah, to basically to the judgment of the court that Graham Gibson was guilty of negligence in this race at Kempton nearly six years ago now. Um, it's, it's taken the BHA a fair amount of time to come up with a response, but, uh, you know, at least we can be sure that this is their definitive thinking. Uh, they got the transcript from all the court proceedings. They've gone over that in detail. They've talked to shareholders, shareholders, stakeholders in horse racing. Um, and uh, to no one's great surprise, they've decided that everything is basically fine and no immediate action is necessary. Um, part of the reason they say that is that there have actually been quite a few changes to the way stewarding has done since Freddie's um, you know, disastrous fall. Um, 2016, that was. Um, I, I have some concerns myself, um, particularly around the interference rules. Freddie Tillitsky came out after the High Court hearing and said himself he would like to see longer suspensions for, for interference, you know, particularly um, bad cases of interference, um, as a way of trying to ensure that races are safer and that the kind of thing that happened to him is not going to happen again to somebody else in the, in the future. The, the BHA's answer to that would be they have a kind of general review of penalties going on. It hasn't, it, it's just about started, but basically it's a job for the second half of this year. There's a lot in the BHA's entry just now. Um, but they're going to get to that. They're going to do a general review of penalties, which will include um, penalties that you get for interference. So fair enough. Um, I mean, you can be reasonably sure that when they review penalties, they tend to go up. So it's going to be another hard time for jockeys. You know, <laughs> they'll have to bear more of that sort of regulatory burden. Um, I felt there was more that could have been said in response to the, the stuff that was heard in the High Court, uh, particularly around the culture in the weighing room. You had Pat Cosgrave saying, look, you know, there's this um, code of conduct among jockeys, not to say too much in Stuart's inquiries, you mm. know. I, I think he was basically giving the, um, the idea that you, you don't point the finger at your mate in the weighing room. You don't say, well, you know, you should be suspending this guy. Yes, yes. Um, and, you know, there was, there was quite a lot of that chat going on around that time because there was the Bryony Frost, Robbie Dunn hearing at the same time, um, you know, where, again, it was gone into that, you know, um, jockeys don't necessarily open up to officials all that readily. Um, there was a, a serving BHA steward who gave evidence at the High Court and said more or less that that's what stewards expect too, that I think he described jockeys as um, taciturn and not, not forthcoming. Um, that's a real problem and we shouldn't be taking it for granted and I'm surprised that the BHA hasn't had something to say on mm. that score, um, it, particularly when it comes to issues of safety, which obviously interference bears specifically upon. Um, I don't think it's asking too much at all to expect frankness from jockeys in their dealings with stewards. You know, they, we should be at least aiming at a culture where um, jockeys speak plainly um, about what happened in a race and stewards can trust them to do that. Um, you know, I, I understand, that, you know, given the, the historical culture of the weighing room, maybe that's not easy. Maybe, you know, maybe we can't achieve that in the next week or two. But we should definitely be aiming in that direction and yeah. telling jockeys this is what we want from them in the future. Absolutely. I mean, you see it, Pat, don't you? We've seen it on the all weather, uh, certainly since Freddie's, you know, incident. We've, we have seen it since. I mean, I remember Ben Curtis being cannoned into the Tapita at, at Wolverhampton coming round that tricky bend. We spoke about it a lot on this show, viewers, haven't we? And also you see horses, be it over jumps or on the flat, when they are on the run-in or in the final furlong and they can hear one coming, it happens all the time, doesn't it? Yeah. And that is a yeah. very frustrating thing as a punter. It must be very frustrating as an owner and a trainer. But you can, if you're on one of these things in front, don't tell me that you haven't gone, cheers, Luke Morris, or you know what I mean? Uh, absolutely, I've had that experience. But, I mean, it's because you know that that has an impact that, that really, you know, when you step back from it all, it, it shouldn't be happening. Yeah. And we need to be clamping down on that kind of behaviour. Yeah. The, the number one thing is that everybody should come back in one piece. Um, and the jockeys have got to be thinking about the safety of each other. Um, 
first and foremost. Yeah, it was a case at Newmarket last year as well, wasn't there? Martin Dwyer, bit by foot design, went right across as well. I remember mm. the finish line. No, it's not going to. They are out there, these examples. <laughs> BHA maybe need to do a bit more. That's what Chris is saying. Uh, I want to come to you, Pat, because mm. page two, Friday paper, Rod Street, the great British racing supremo, has done a piece about getting young people into racing and keeping them, and they think audience attendances have maybe gone up. But you've got a great example out there. Yeah, absolutely. I was at uh, Musselburgh for the two-day meeting last week, and on Sunday it was student day. Now, the weather was inclement, really, but uh, there was a real healthy uh, <laughs> yeah. crowd there, and uh, full of students, and there was a, it was a marvellous package that they had. I'm not sure the actual amount it was, but it was coaches from Edinburgh University, St Andrews University, um, entry. It was just a great occasion there, very lively. Um, and they did seem to enjoy themselves. And, and yes, it was that typical thing when they go round the circuit to, twice or more, big cheer goes up as they pass the line. When there was a loose horse galloping past, yeah, a great cheer. But it was just a good, fun atmosphere. Mm. And I was thinking, let's say a thousand people turned up that were students. How many of them are going to come back and want to go again and tell their friends, we had a great day, you should try it. And uh, yeah, I, I thought, okay, there, there, there is life in this sport yet, particularly at a young age. And it wasn't necessarily about the betting. It was about being there and the occasion. They were all in their glad rags. They all had a great time. And as a social day out, it was excellent. And mm. I'm sure they'll get repeat business. As I touched on, the muscle, they've got Ladies' Day coming up and certain things like that. So, yeah, the, the, the student uh, angle is, is very much one to consider. Seeing is believing. I was there Sunday, and it was a good, healthy, and happy crowd there. Well, there you go. Positive story then for Musselburgh's two-day meeting. Chris, it's, it's a win-win, isn't it? You imagine other tracks will catch on to this if they haven't already. I'm sure some, some race course directors will be, hang on a minute, mention us or whatever. But social media's <laughs> got a part to play, hasn't it? And keeping these people happy at the races is important. The youth act, it always used to be Limerick, didn't it? They used to have the yeah. very yeah, famous right. day, you I'm know. I'm sure that still goes on. Yeah. Um, I was at Chepstow one of the um, Saturdays in October and they had a student's day. And I mean, it did, actually really did lift the atmosphere having a you know, good number of young folk having a great time there. I had some slight concerns about the facilities that were available to them. It, it sort of felt like they'd been corralled at the end of the grandstand, you know, sort of away from the serious <laughs> race scores. Um, but, they, you know, they still seem to be having a high old time and there's every hope that, um, you know, for some of them, that'll be the start of like a, a lifelong affection for the game. Mm, you think as we're coming out of this non-restrictive pandemic lifestyle that we might want to keep these audience that are desperate to get out to no matter what it is, a social occasion out there. All right, third one, I'm going to go... Back to Chris now. NFL was referenced by you this week. It's a big Sunday out there, isn't it? Come on, you Bengals and all that sort of thing. Um, Super Bowl Sunday comes up, right. and you did a nice little reference about how NFL bosses might freak out if they looked at the state of our racing at the moment. Well, um, I do like a bit of NFL. I mean, I just, without getting too deeply into it or anything like that, it's, it's my fun sport. You know, now that I'm racing is my work. I can watch the NFL and just let it wash over me and not feel I have to read every story. Um, sure. But what I really appreciate um, is the sort of 60 or 70 year effort that they've made to ensure the competition level remains high in the NFL. It, to some extent, it's easy to do with a closed league of 32 teams, but they've got lots of sort of strictures and rules in place to, to make sure that, you know, no one team becomes dominant, you know, over a long period. And I, everyone will say, oh, New England Patriots, they've been good forever, which is fair. But actually, the last 13 years, you've got 11 different teams winning the Super Bowl. Um, and until three weeks from the end of this season, 27 of the 32 teams could still get into the playoffs, technically. Um, so they've been really successful at sort of keeping that competition alive. Every game is interesting, even when you've got a big-name team against the Minnow at the end of the season. The Minnow might have nothing mm. to play for. You might even expect them to be tanking, so they'd be higher in the draft. And, you know, you get these surprise results just the same um, because of the salary cap and the draft and the way all of that works. It just strikes me that where in America, you know, the land of the free and, you know, they've got this sort of expectation of, um, you know, free trade and there will be no restrictions on business. Um, they still have all of these rules in place that these rich men who own NFL teams um, have to live with. And here in Britain um, with our horse racing, we're much more hands off, laissez faire. And we've gravitated to a state of affairs where uh, you've got these super trainers that have a much greater proportion of the equine talent than ever they used to sort of 40 or 50 years ago. Um, and I, I, I'm afraid it is, it's having an impact on the game's appeal, doesn't it? You, you only got to look at um, all the odds on winners and the grade ones at the Dublin Racing Festival. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, not to sort of point fingers at any one yard in particular. Um, you know, the, the, there's, there's some in Newmarket. It's flat racing as well as jumps, Britain as well as Ireland. 
why aren't we even talking about things like a cap that might be in place on the number of horses that one person can train or you know, the number of entries that you can make at a major racing festival um, just for the sake of keeping it interesting, keeping other trainers and owners involved. Um, I, I think that might be better for the sport's long-term future. And everybody's sport, if you like, yeah. You know, some diversity might come into that as well. Uh, but then, Pat, there'll be people screaming and going, well, if I want to have a horse with Willie Mullins, I should be allowed to have a horse with Willie Mullins, you know. Yeah, the way the NFL is set up, um, the, w the worst team of the previous season gets the best kid from college. So I'm, I'm not quite sure how is you... Is that why the Bengals are doing so well, is it? Is it? <laughs> so that, 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 that gets the... It's long enough. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not quite sure. Let's say I'm the worst trainer last season. I get honeysuckle. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure how, how that... I that, fancy that idea, now that you're no, saying. I mean, I don't, maybe even I'd take out a licence if that was the case. You could, uh, you know. I, I don't know what the way around is, but as I say, being at Musborough, I, I spoke to John McConnell, an excellent Irish trainer who does ever so well on his raids over here. He had a winner uh, and, uh, at Musborough that day. And I said to him, oh, you, you do very well on your, on your visits over. And he says, well, I can, I can come over here and have a realistic chance of winning, or I can be fourth to Willie, Gordon and Henry. Mm. And at least I'm winning and I'm on mm. the scoreboard and financially it's about the same, but I'm having winners. Yeah. So it's a, it, it's a difficult one going forward, that's for sure. I just I wish we felt open enough to at least have these conversations and, and talk about how we can ensure racing is more competitive in the future because I, I don't think we can just let things drift. No, there perhaps is a slight worry going forward, isn't it? You look at the Dublin Racing Festival and uh, an alarming amount of races since its inception have gone to the top three yards over there. Have your say below. Part of an absolutely unbelievable Saturday card, another one for you. It's the three o'clock game spirit. We're used to small fields in this or hot pots, but Pat Kearney, despite the fact we've got a non-runner, we're down to four. The prices look rather generous. Yeah, the Fab Four, and I, I would imagine looking around, you'll probably get about nine to four of the field at the moment. Now, three o'clock on Saturday, that's a key time because we'll have had several of the Paul Nichols big guns already come out and perform. If they've won, then I've no doubt Hitman will then be favourite. If they've disappointed, Brave Man's Game or Klander's Obu, then the market will go against mm. him. And so it, there's a lot of life in this market yet. Hard to pick the favourite just now. You've got So Royal, who the punters love, won this race a year ago. Sky Pirate, the race sets up well for him. You know, he's a, he's a contender. But a lot of people seem to think uh, that man again, Charlie Deutsch, could be the man with the Funambul Savola, who, again... Bit to find on official ratings, he's uh, nine pound and six pound to find respectively with the front two, but he's a horse going forward. So I, I could definitely see Charlie winning this one, I think. Yeah, this bloke of course has placed at the top level as a novice. You chased home first flow in the Peterborough, uh, Charlie. Then Fernabel de Cervola went up to Donny and everyone just expected you to go and take what looked like a lenient handicap mark and throw it over your shoulder. But you had to work really hard that day, didn't you? How, how is this chap? Yeah, no, um, I, I'm really fond of the horse. He, uh, he's kind of a tough little scrappy sort of horse. And yeah, it was hard work up at Doncaster. Um, I think um, Sam Thomas's horse put up a good fight and um, the ground was um, tacky in places, which uh, probably slowed him up a bit. But um, I, I, no, I'd be looking forward to him. He, I think he would like the course, uh, the ground, but obviously there's not much in it between the... Uh, is it three of us and um, yeah there's not much in it and uh, he'll have to be at the top of his game And but I'm, I'm more than sure he's capable anyway and uh, he's jumping very slick and he's not slow Mm, I have to say, and I'm, I'm not just currying favour with our guest, when I applied the trends I, I get to, uh, the excellent uh, Kevin Morley gives me his trends forecast if you like for the big races on a Monday, Tuesday and we sort of apply them through and I knocked out all bar uh, on the trends Fernandel and Editor Tajit as well. And our Editor Tajit coming out, guys, is, yep. means it could be a bit of a messy race, isn't it? Uh, it's, that's the problem pace-wise, isn't it? I think there, there is no strong pace here, and, and therefore, you know, isn't it going to fall in Sue Royale's lap? And again, you know, he's the one with the uh, possibility to accelerate at the end. He's got that hurdle race speed. Yeah. Um, won it last year. How have your trends knocked out last year's winner, by the way? He's, I think it was an age thing. It was a, it was yeah, an amount of ch n runners and all that sort of thing and uh, uh, how many ch chase starts you've had and all that sort of thing. You can get that, of course, in your members club uh, from 6pm on, on Friday evening, Saturday morning, if you're watching this show now. Check it out. And uh, the Betfair hurdle looks very interesting on that front. And 
this guy, if he didn't, I, I just loved his attitude last time, uh, Fernandel. I'm not sure about Hitman. Never mind stable form, anything like that. I'm not totally sure. I still don't know why he didn't win the Holden Gold Cup, really. Well, he was a strong finisher by uh, El Dorado Allen, wasn't it? it? Was. So I suppose if he wins earlier, maybe you take that as well, a kind of form That's boost, it. you know? It just, he looked, what was he, 1 0 whatever on the exchanges, yeah. jumping the yeah. last. And, I don't know. He's he, he has apart from that protector at form at Aintree. I don't know. Is this is he? He's either overrated. I can't work it out. He's either win or come last for me, yet, man. So I'm against him. I, I think his rate is probably about right. You know, when he's on song and and he's best in at the weights, isn't he? But yeah. uh, you know, taken with the stable form concern, um, I, I wouldn't be taking a short price about him in this race. So royal. So royal, definitely. Yeah. All right, Pat. Uh, Fulham Bull. Oh, there you go, Charlie. Double penalty for myself and Pat. <laughs> Right, let's cram in these race previews for you. And it's about to get tougher for our panellists, let me tell you, because the 3.15 is a two-mile handicap chase around Warwick with some right old characters in it, Pat Cooney. I'm sensing an open market. Uh, absolutely. I would imagine you'll probably get at least five the field tomorrow. And wow. it's just the tricky one, isn't it? You've got the likes of Celeb Dallin, Philip Hobbs, a 10-year-old. Um, he went up nine for his last win, though, so the handicapper was there that day. He doesn't... <laughs> scream as though he's uh, well handicapped. One that we have laid is right at the bottom, the King of May, Brian Ellison. Now he won a class three at Sedgefield and he went up seven and now we're asking him to win a class two. And it is just that type of race. So do you want to get with the horses who won last time out, but they've gone up in the weights and maybe taken on harder company? Or do you want to back the horses that have just generally not quite doing it, but have dropped a bit? So a real conundrum in the race. I suppose Falco Blitz because it's Nicky Henderson, might go a favourite. Yeah. But he comes with a few uh, reservations, I suppose. My eye was drawn to number seven, Dinny Lacey, an Irish horse, Robbie Power coming over to Warwick. And I just thought, oh, well, that, that, that seems interesting to me. Now, this horse, uh, Dinny Lacey, he, he was five to one favourite for the Munster National, and he was only 11th of 15. And I would say, on balance, a Munster National would have been a harder race to win than this. But there was an awful lot of money flying around for him that day. He's run a lot better since. It just jumps out the page, Robbie mm. Power at Warwick, and he's going to be a price. So I might need three or four stabs at this one. But uh, so long as one of my darts is Dinny Lacey, I'll be happy. For the more than capable Motherway stable. Mm. Uh, and um, all right, pot picking from Ireland for Pat then. I mean, and more, than, more than capable. They've won an Irish national, haven't they? I mean, not recently. It's the sort of name that might not mean a lot to, yeah. you know, your, your, your average Saturday punter maybe. But I mean, you've got to respect them. And yeah, that jumped out at me as well. I just worried about the ground. You know, I wonder if maybe this horse could have done with it softer. Yeah. Maybe when they were hatching this plan, they were expecting, you know, Warwick in February would often be softer than we're Well, there's a few in there, aren't there? Riders on the Storm, who's got that back class. And yeah. the other one, of course, is Lieutenant Rocco, who definitely wants some cut underfoot, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah, and uh, there were uh, even one or two other celebrity. Dallin, yeah. two wins were on heavy, weren't they? So yeah. I thought maybe our power for the Sam Thomas stable that has been quite a reliable source. He'll love the ground, won't he? And his sense is a bit more to come. I'm slightly worried about his fencing around Warwick, but he was on my radar. I thought Cheddleton might be the one here. Okay. He's got that. Cl he's got a lot of threes and twos next to yeah. his name, but yep. exactly countering what Pat said there. Some horses have gone up. This might just be the right race for him, a front runner around Warwick. If he gets his own way, I think he might have a say. So there you go. It's a tricky conundrum. Will it be the Irish pot picking for you? 3.35, the final big race preview for you then on What A Shout this weekend. And it is a biggie. It's the Betfair hurdle. Now, the first thing to say about this before we go to Pat for a market update, who's hot and who is not. Chris, 14 runners, which is the smallest field we've had since it was rescheduled to go to Ascot when it was called off a couple of years ago when yeah. the purse was down. Uh, David Carr, our roving northern stalwart, suggested that in the comment in the paper it was the death of the valuable and great handicap hurdles. Where do you sit with this? Wow. Stuff like that makes me want to cry. Oh, uh, but might have a point, <laughs> mightn't he? I don't know. I mean, it was a decent field last year, wasn't it? I mean, I only have to go back one year. It's usually the max, which is 24, isn't yeah, it? So it's, it's, it's why not this year, then? It is disappointing, and I don't, I don't know. Um, and, of course, as everyone's been saying, you know, sure as eggs is eggs, you'll get a bigger, stronger field for the county hurdle, which is worth less money. But everybody loves a Cheltenham winner, don't they? Yeah, of course. Um, I don't quite get it. I'm disappointed for Newbury. It, it's still an interesting, absorbing puzzle, um, you know, if you got down to sort of 11, 10, 9 runners, that would have been bad. But I mean, I can remember there was a, an example of a smaller field in this race, oh, 15, you know, 20 years back. It can sometimes happen. 
Um, we can't just be, you know, throwing our hands in the air and crying. The Dublin Racing Festival might have had time. something to do with that. Liffey, didn't we? Which is the old Pierce, if you like. That's, that's right, because it used to be feasible to run in that and then yeah. come in a uh, spirit leader, I'm sure. Yes. Run in one and then the other. And then Jesse one. Jesse Arrington's yeah, great yeah. man. Um, so, yeah, that, that must be a factor, I guess. Mm, great memories from this race, though, Spirit Lady. You mentioned, of course, you remember Geos Rooster Booster. I remember, mm. that was, oh, I remember being there. It was a there. good era for this race. And, and Martin it? Pipe used to always have something that would go five furlong pace to the first. Um, <laughs> there are some front runners in there, Pat Cooney, but who's leading the market at the moment? Well, this, this is one of these races where when, when you get the entries through and you think, OK, well, we've, we've got to price the race up, everyone just goes straight to the stats and as a start-off point. So you look at the last 10 years or so, it's been won by five and six-year-olds, all second season novices. So when you're looking at the race, you think, oh, that's easy then. What are they? We'll make them at the front end of the market. And they're the three. JPR1, mm. he's one of them. Uh, you've got uh, Broomfield Berg, mm. another one, same scenario, Napa Sill. They're all the same. So we've priced them up. So they've never been bargains, really. And I think what happens with the market is people go, oh, but it's not necessarily about the second season novices. So there's a lot of life left in this one. Soaring Glory, he has been popular. Now, he won this race a year ago. He was £14 lower, though. Mm. But he did come out and win ever so well at Ascot on his reappearance. And I fleetingly thought, I wonder if this might be the champion hurdle without Honeysuckle Horse. And it's not been the case, albeit in small fields since. He needs a bigger field, a stronger race. Well, he's going to get that. I could see Soaring Glory being the one that shortens up in the market. It's a bit um, surprising he's not gone fencing this year. Soar and Glory. Well, I thought that that yeah. was the natural route for him. If they look at the Arkell division now, maybe they're kicking themselves they didn't. But yeah. does that mean that the John Joe firm, you know, really know how to place the horses very well, think that he's still capable of doing it? Tom Segal likes him, of course. Some other judges are putting him up saying these small field races are no good for him. Can you see him doing it again? Uh, yeah, he's continued to show quality, hasn't he? He won another handicap at Ascot in the autumn there. Um, but the one I'm looking at is, is 50 ball, and because he was second to him last year. Um, and he's a stone better in with Sword yeah. and Glory this and time. The Goshen so, colours, of course, last weekend. What so a time they had. Their careers have kind of gone a bit like that, because 50 ball, they tried to make a chase out of him. And he ran well the first time, and then it hasn't worked. The fences have been getting in the way a little bit. But, I mean, we know that has worked with other horses, you know, back to hurdles after yeah. the abortive early foray over fences. Same mark as last year? Same mark as last year. Stone better in with the winner quite appealing really for the Gary Muir Yard that's done well in this race. I mean, the, Gary's really punched up of his weight, mm. I would say, in this race over the years, three wins yeah. already. Yeah. He knows how to win it with a, I don't want to say plot horse, but it's <laughs> the one that is not that obvious, you know. Uh, you're right. He is interesting, isn't he? And a lot of judges fancied him at the start of the week. You've got another one? Yeah, Lord Badsley, the rank outsider, Whoa. I think, is, is very interesting. I mean, as we're talking here, I think 50 is one still available. Um, you have to see if maybe one or two influential tipsters stick him up. You know, that, that can crash quite quickly, those silver odds. But uh, Chris Gordon Yard, um, they're, you know, really firing now, whereas for, you know, the previous, like, 10 months, they weren't so much, which I think covers a lot of, you know, where a few of his bad runs. Um, plus, I think there's a ground issue. He's going to get a decent surface, which he really pings off. He won over course and distance at the end of last March when he was... Yeah. obviously appreciating um, that kind of ground. Um, and he's back down now to the same sort of mark that he had in those days. Um, you know, I think he's, he's really interesting and I, I don't know why he's being discounted. Of the sexy ones, the, the five and six-year-old is a huge stat in this, if you yeah. believe your trends and historical winners and all that sort of thing. Uh, never run in a handicap before. The first or second season, novice owners, we know all about that. Of them, Broomfield Berg, he has run in a handicap, hasn't he? Chris, come to you on this. Uh, he, of course, was beaten at Cheltenham. Yeah. They seem to fancy this every time he runs. So Well, you can see why he'd be back, because you know, he's that really sort of strong traveller type who's going to catch your eye for a, lo you know, a long time in these jump races. Um, but then the only time he's been in a handicap before, it, you looked for all the world as who he's going to go past mm. and when is he liked, and he just didn't. And, and part of that is, of course, because he's expending energy, isn't he, when he's travelling so strongly. He's a horse that takes a grip. Now, maybe he's just going to settle in behind a strong pace in a, a big field like this. That can happen. You know, maybe he's, he's maturing. Maybe we're going to see a, a more professional performance. But I, am, I don't fancy taking a short price about a horse with that kind of profile. You yeah, know? the Kempton cakewalk which was supposed to be that has got a bit of substance to it what about jpr1 i've been with him since the start actually i caught wind of how much they liked about this guy was with him at exeter when he's one was with him at Cheltenham when he somehow got beaten and then he actually do you look watch back that final hurdle at, at taunton last time he races away from them paul nichols has got a line on him through that race however with nappers hill and oh, 
I didn't put up Dolos last week, and the, you know what will happen now when I'm like, let's tear it all up. Let's just, if you fancy yours, go for it. It will probably kick in. But I thought Napasil of them was the definitely the value. Surprised he's getting three pounds from. I like to move it. We beat despite things conspiring against the Bayern. John Bon last time. If he gets his jumping together, and he did wasn't great two out there. If he's learnt from that, I think he'll. I think he'll have definitely have a say. And race at Nichols knows how to win, of course. Yeah, it's just a tricky race, isn't it? I say if you want to go with these. Uh, unexposed types, it's a bit of a leap of faith, isn't it? You know, if you'd said to me, JPR one's going to be favourite to win the Betfair hurdle, I would have said, well, I can understand him winning, but I can't imagine him being favourite for the race, but that's what he is at the moment. I, I, I think he'll drift on the day. The, the one I keep coming back to is your toil of Ryan Potter with Lorcan Williams aboard. He's a seven-year-old, but he is a second season novice, and he's one over further. Constitution Hill form. So if you're a Constitution Hill fan, you'd be hoping he could win the bet for off a 10-12. And he's one over further, a fast run race should play to his strengths. Yeah, we've got Boot Hill in there, he's got some yeah. good form. We've got Tritonic in there, so mm. it's still a strong race, right? Yeah, and I think I'd almost rather go with a horse like Tritonic, who's a bit more battle-hardened than something that's just sort of completely unexposed, never run in a handicap before. Mm. You know, Forget the Kempton experiment, shall we say? Uh, well, I'm interested in when you say Napper's Hill, um, how would you play that then, Dave? Are you going to be back taking the price now in case it shortens? Are you going to wait to see what, how those early... Na- I'm glad I Nichols didn't take a price run. at the start of the week because he was shorter than he is now. Of Correct. course, Nichols yeah. then drew stumps, didn't he? So we're, uh, this is one that you can wait until the off for, I think, because they'll probably be coming for JP's Bloomberg and JPR1. It depends, doesn't it? Will, will the likes of Chris Cook mean that Lord Battersley and certainly 50 Bull come in as well yeah fascinating all right there you go we could go on and on and on it's still a belter despite the 14 who comes out on top for you in the bet fair it's nap time on this weekend's what a shout will it be warwick will it be newbury will it be somewhere completely random as usual pat cooney uh warwick for me ah. and it's in the 240 number one fine casting trained by the excellent ben paulin uh lightly raced progressive Won well at Newbury last time. He won by, I thought, a long looking four and a half lengths. And he only went up six pound. And I'm thinking, God, if I owned that horse, I would have expected an eight, nine or ten rise. So on that basis, he's ahead of the handicapper. And he's progressing well. So uh, that one's my nap. Mm, Okay, Ben Pauling loves Warwick. Chris Cook. Now, we're all rooting for you after Storm Control. (laughs) Who's it going to be? I'm due one, aren't I? You Um, are. El Dorado Allen. Can't even say the horse's name. Um, (laughs) He's not like he's a certain winner or anything, but I think he is um, a much bigger price than he should be. Mm, Interesting. I wonder whether some of our other judges go for that at the price as well. For me, it'll be in the last. Look no further than... Wow, isn't Gary Moore having a great time of it in 2022? And his authorised speed finally showed what he's all about in a bumper at Newbury last time. This one throws up a decent horse. He's more than that for me. Charlie Deutsch, have you got a best ride, a best hope for this weekend, maybe for our viewers? Um, we've got a nice young horse running at Exeter in the bumper. He was second last time at Haydock. And um, no, I, I really like him. Um, if you want to keep if he, if he doesn't run win on Sunday, he'd be worth um, keeping an eye on. Um, he's a nice little, little young horse, so um, that'd be one I'd be. N- name Charlie? Uh, he did, he did. Oh, sorry, Hermes. Hermes the good, nice little young horse. <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> all right. All of a sudden, our viewers who are just about to press that's a good show for the weekend, or that's an absolutely terrible show, just went, hang on a minute, what's that? Yeah. And they're going to their members' club <laughs> section and they found him. All right, okay, Charlie, fantastic. There is your weekend full timer. Well, okay. sadly, that's all we've got time for then on this weekend's What a Shout. Pat Cooney, thank you for coming back down. We'll see more of you before the festival, I hope. Yes, looking forward to it. And uh, good luck to Charlie, the uh, the hottest rider in the game at the moment. Yeah, it was a good good show. Chris, thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me. How's the weekend looking? What are we, anything breaking? What can we, anything going on? Uh, well, I should just be trying to pick some winners, you know, and hopefully it'll be one or two that we've mentioned already. Fantastic. All right, well, hopefully you'll see you seeing Chris very shortly again here on What a Shout. I know you'll love him out there. And I know you all love Charlie Deutsch as well. What a year you're having, 2022, Charlie Deutsch. And it has been an absolute star in its ascendancy. I imagine it's going to get better. All the best for this weekend. And long press in the turners. No, thanks very much for having me. And um, no, good to be on. And uh, hopefully we can keep, keep running well with all the horses. And uh, hopefully the form carries on all season. 
I'm sure it will, absolutely. I'm sure Venetia will be having lots to say about that. What a pleasure to have that young man on the show then. What a pleasure to have you watching us as well. Get your comments in for the panellists below. Don't forget, of course, if you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. Don't forget to download the free Must Have Racing Post app. You can do it on the App Store or the Google Play Store. Okay, so for myself, Dave Orton, gamble responsibly. There's lots of sport out there. Enjoy it.